right. So last time we had a lesson was before we did the um, the review week, and that was January fourth. So almost a month. It's been it's been a little while. So we were talking about uh, sine and cosine. <clears throat> do you want to remember what do they look like when you draw them? Like sine and cosine. Are they like straight lines? Are they circles? Wave. Yeah, it's like a wave. Yeah, looks like a wave. And we looked at those graphs in a lot of depth. Okay, we did shifting, stretching, reflecting, all the stuff. We're going to look at all the other trig functions today. So that's the tangent, the cotangent, the secant, and the cosecant. But we don't go into as much depth, and we really don't do a lot of sketching by hand like we did with sine and cosine. Okay, anything that we do is going to be drawn on the calculator. All right, so let's take a look at um, those graphs and um, see what we can do. So first, I want to think a little bit about the graph of tangent. We had a formula that we could write tangent in terms of two other trig functions that we've already studied a lot about. And it was a fraction. Does anybody remember how you can write tangent as something over something? And it's a trig function in the top and another one in the bottom. Remember? Yeah? Isn't it like y over x? Yep, it is what we talked about it on a unit circle, and it's y over x. What was y on the unit circle? Which trig function was that? I remember, yeah. Sign. Yep. Y was the sign. And does anyone remember when we did unit circle, which trig function was the x? Cosine. Yep. It was the cosine. So you can write tangent like this. You can write tangent as sine over cosine. Now I want to think about each one of these graphs. I'm not going to do like a detailed sketch, just kind of a quick sketch. So sine looks like that. This is pi, 2 pi, and over there is 0. Okay, now let me do cosine. It looks similar, it's a wave, but remember, it doesn't start at the origin. It starts up at the top like this, and then it comes down. And I'm going to mark this as zero. This point is pi over 2. That's pi. 3 pi over 2. And where it ends is 2 pi. I just don't have enough space to label everything. But the two, the important ones are where it crosses the x-axis. Pi, 2 pi, 0. Technically, 2 pi is a repeat of 0 because this is the start of the next cycle. Okay. So really, we'll focus on the 0 and the pi. And here, the pi over 2 and the 3 pi over 2. That's where it crosses the axis. And I'll get rid of the one we're not really going to focus on right now. So cosine crosses the x-axis, crosses two times per cycle. When a graph crosses the x-axis, what is the what's the y value of the coordinate? Zero. Zero. The y value is zero. So that means that this, oops, this what I just circled can come out to zero. In fact, it comes out to zero in the two spots I circled in red. If this comes out to zero, we're going to have a zero in the bottom of a fraction. What happens if you try to divide by zero? It's undefined. And what does that look like on a graph? A vertical what? Vertical uh, It is a vertical something, yeah? Is it a hole? It could be a hole. Um, we're going to get an asymptote, though. So that's what's going to happen with all the graphs we do today. They are going to have asymptotes because if you write it like this, 
the bottom of this fraction could be zero. It's not always zero, but it could be zero in the right spot. And that's going to cause a vertical asymptote. Now, let's look at the top one. The graph of sine could also be zero at the two numbers I circled in red. Same idea. When we cross the x-axis, the y value is zero. What happens if the top of a fraction is zero? What does that do to a fraction if you make the top zero? Yeah, it just makes it zero. It makes, yeah, it makes the whole thing zero. So this will come out to zero whenever the top is zero. Because if the top is zero, it makes the whole thing zero. So the graph of tangent will cross the x-axis exactly where sine crosses the x-axis. It's going to cross at zero, and it's going to cross at pi, and two pi, and three pi, and four pi, five pi, six pi, seven pi. It keeps crossing forever. But like we did with sine and cosine, we're going to mostly focus on sketching one cycle in just one section. So the graph of tangent is going to be zero whenever sine is zero. And the graph of tangent is going to have a vertical asymptote whenever the bottom comes out to zero. And what's in the bottom? Cosine. Okay, so we're going to use those two pieces of information to help us make a sketch. Okay, so I already have the sketch done, so we're not, we're not going to spend a ton of time on it. But what we want to focus on is it should be crossing the x-axis at 0 and pi. And there should be vertical asymptotes at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And 5 pi over 2, 7 pi over 2. All odd multiples of pi over 2. Let's take a look and see what it looks like. Oh, I didn't actually sketch it. All right, so now let's let's sketch what I just said. Um, so vertical asymptotes at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Okay. It's going to cross the x-axis at 0 and pi. So I could put a dot there for that. 0 and pi. I'm going to focus on the one at pi right now because I want to sketch what's going to be between those dots. I mean, I guess I could just put one more asymptote. It's going to look exactly the same. So I'll sketch two cycles of tangent. Now, let me pick a value that's very close to pi over 2. Okay. What's, what's pi over 2 in degrees? 90. 90. So let me take the tangent of like 90.1 and see what happens. That's going to tell me I'm either going to be up very, very high next to this asymptote, or I'm going to be down very low. Okay. But don't, don't type 90, because 90 is the asymptote. You're going to get an error. You can't take the tangent of 90. Well, let's go very close to it. Let's do 90.01. So if I go just after 90, I'm down at negative 5,700. So it's, it's way, way down. It's way, way down. And usually on one side of the asymptote, if it's down, on the other side of the asymptote, it's up. Okay. So now let's, let's check a number 3 pi over 2. That's my other asymptote. 3 pi over 2 is... 270. So let's try like the tangent of 269.9. And as we expected, it is way, way off. It's up at over 500. So tangent goes up and down forever. Okay. Not like sine and cosine, where it's, it's kind of trapped between negative 1 and 1. It goes up and down forever. Okay. So we need to connect those three dots. Um, and it is curved. So tangent looks something like this. 
as you go up, it just keeps getting closer and closer, almost vertical, but obviously never, never completely vertical. And here's another section of it. So that's what tangent looks like. It's those curves, and they keep repeating. Okay, if we go to y equals and then type it in, if you do zoom 7, you'll see the same thing. A lot of times they'll ask you to just show maybe two cycles or one cycle. Any question on what the graph looks like? Now, if I number these asymptotes, one, two, three. Okay, and let's do one more. And now let me number the cycle. Okay, so from here to here. Just so I don't use numbers again, let's call this cycle A. From here to here is cycle B. And from here to here is cycle C. We have to understand how many asymptotes there are per cycle. You can't say that asymptote 1 and 2 both belong to cycle A. Each asymptote can only belong to one cycle. So if you're saying 1 and 2 belong to A, then you're saying every cycle has two of them. Well, then what are you going to do for B? You can't say two and three belong to B because you already said two belongs to A. So how many asymptotes do you think belong to each cycle? Well, yeah, it's just one. It doesn't matter how you think about it, but I'm going to say that asymptote one belongs to cycle A. Asymptote two belongs to cycle B. Asymptote 3 belongs to cycle C. Again, it doesn't matter which one you think of as belonging to it, as long as you only understand there's only one asymptote per cycle. It's kind of like arm armrests, you know, like in chairs that are next to each other. You can't have everybody take two, because then that won't work. You can take one, and if everyone agrees to take the same one, then it works. Four more belong to them. Four would belong to cycle D, the next cycle. <coughs> yep. So each asymptote only has one cycle. And we didn't really mention it, but we said pi over 2 is 90. What did I say 3 pi over 2 is? 270. 270. Pi over 2 is the beginning of the cycle. 3 pi over 2 is the end of the cycle. What's the difference between 90 and 270? 180. 180. That is the cycle length of the tangent. That's different than sine and cosine. Does anybody remember what the normal cycle was for sine and cosine? 360. It was 360. So tangent, and we're going to write that down, but tangent has a cycle length of 180 degrees or pi radians. And when I give you the formula, well, I'm going to write that exactly down in a minute. So kind of jump ahead a little. But the period of tangent and the period of cotangent is pi. Now, tangent is sine over cosine. What's the connection between tangent and cotangent? It's the reciprocal. It just means to flip it. So when we graph cotangent, it's going to look very similar to that. The curve is going to switch directions. So instead of always curving up and to the right, it's going to curve down and to the right. And because the sine and the cosine are going to flip, everywhere that you cross the x-axis in this picture is going to become an asymptote. Everywhere that you had an asymptote is going to become where it crosses the x-axis. So everything is going to switch places between tangent and cotangent. There's cotangent. So before we had an asymptote at pi over 2, that's tangent. In cotangent, pi over 2 is where it crosses. Uh, pi was where it crossed. Now pi 
is an asymptote. So all the crossings and asymptotes, just they just switch places. And it's the same deal with the asymptotes. There's only one asymptote per cycle. So any question on um, what tangent and cotangent look like? They're pretty similar. And, well, actually, I have a question. How would you type cotangent in on the calculator since you don't have a button for it? Yeah? Right. Like cosine x over sine x? Yeah, you could do cosine x over sine x, or you could do 1 over the tangent. And that's exactly the graph. The cycle that I'm showing you on the one I did by hand is this cycle right here. Okay. So any question on that picture? And as we already kind of pointed out with tangent, the length of a cycle is pi, or 180 degrees. So what, what does that mean, that the length of the cycle is pi? Right, well, let me go back to my calculator. It means that if you, let's say you had an answer in this cycle. Like maybe you drew a line in y1, you drew this graph in y2, and you wanted to see where they cross. And let's say they cross right there. Okay. Here's your line you put in y2. If you look... Oops, I didn't do a good job with that. That's okay. If you want have this answer and you want to get this answer, it's going to occur exactly 3.14 minutes later. You'll get exactly the same answer in the next cycle. So that means on the calculator, if you take the tangent of let's say 2, or you take the tangent of 2 plus pi, you should get exactly the same thing if you add pi, because you're getting the same spot one cycle later. Tangent of 2 plus 3 pi, well, that's the same answer three cycles later. Tangent of 2 minus 4 pi, that would work as well. That's the same answer four cycles earlier. So it's just moving you to these different points. But it's all the same answer, just in different cycles. So that's where that formula comes from. If you take the tangent of a number, or you take the tangent of that number and you add any multiple of pi, you'll get the same answer. With sine and cosine, we could add any multiple of 360, and we could get the same answer. That's why when we do unit circle trig, if I asked you to take like the sine of 1,980 degrees, that's pretty complicated because it's a big angle. We can subtract 360 as many times as we want till we get that angle smaller, and it doesn't mess up our answer. Okay, same idea here. So tangent and coaching. But it has to be a multiple of pi. You can't do something like tangent of 2 plus 1.3 pi. That's not going to work. You have to add a full pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, not a fraction of pi. So n is an integer. Okay, any question on that idea? All right, so now if somebody said to me, find the tangent of 560 degrees, and I 
couldn't quite visualize what that is. I could say, well, let's take 560. It's going to be the same as tangent of 380. And I say, all right, that's still kind of big. Let's minus 180 again. It's the same as the tangent of 200, which is the same as the tangent of 20. So 20 is a lot easier for me to work with because it's smaller. And it's the same as 560 in terms of tangent. All right, um, so transformations. When we do transformations with sine and cosine, that's exactly the same as every transformation we've done all year. I mean, tangent and cosine. Okay, it's exactly the same as all the others. So I put, I put the diagram up, and we'll go through the A, the B, the C, and the D. Um, does anybody remember what A does? It's adding, or it could be subtracting, but it's inside the parentheses. Yep. That's a horizontal shift, also called a phase shift, a horizontal shift. Um, plus moves it to the left and minus to the right. Yeah, just because I have D next to it, let's do D. Um, what does adding or subtracting do outside the parentheses? That's your vertical shift. And if D is positive, it would shift it up, negative, down. Okay, so adding and subtracting, that's your shifting. Now we've got multiplying. Um, what does multiplying by a number inside do? Horizontal what? Stretch or shrink, yep. Yeah. So it changes the period. Okay. Let's say horizontal stretch. They just call it a period <coughs> change when you talk about trig functions. Horizontal stretch, horizontal shift. Uh, and what about C? That's multiplying, but it's in front. Vertical stretch. Yep. Yeah. With sine and cosine, we talk about it in terms of the amplitude, but really tangent and cotangent, they go up and down forever. So they don't really have an amplitude. You'd almost say it's like infinity. So I'm just going to call it a vertical stretch. And if C or B are negative numbers, that causes your graph to do what? Reflection. Reflection. Yep. So we've gone through that in a lot of detail before, so I didn't do as much this time. Um, does anyone have any questions on more detail about the A, B, C, or D? Yep. Uh, B, uh, when it's negative, it makes a reflection over the x-axis. When B is negative, that's a reflection over, that's a horizontal reflection, which is over the y-axis. When C is negative, that's a vertical reflection. So that's over the x-axis. So vertical reflection would look like this. There you go. That's a vertical reflection. Anything else? All right. So uh, one type of question we had is finding the period of a graph. And when we did sine and cosine, the formula was 2 pi over b. The tangent and cotangent, it's pi over b. In general, it's always the original cycle length divided by b. And remember what b is. The number in front of x. So for sine and cosine, the original cycle length is 2 pi. That's why it's 2 pi over b. For tangent and cotangent, the original cycle length is pi. Pi over b. Alright, uh, let me see. Okay, I'm going to come 
back to this. I want to do it in a little different order. So I'll come back to that. And make sure there's nothing we need. Yeah. So we'll come back to that. All right, so let's try a problem. Um, it says find the period of y equals tangent 2x, and then find a complete, a complete graph that shows three cycles. Okay, what is my formula to find the period of tangent? Yep. Pi over b. Pi over b. In this case, um, what is B? 2. That is the length of the period. The answer is pi over 2. Now, they want me to show three cycles. Pi over 2 would be 1. How much would three cycles be? 3 pi over 2. Three pi over two. Yes. So we need to set a window that is 3 pi over 2 units. Um, the easiest way to do it is 0 to 3 pi over 2. It's like if you had to set a window 5 units wide. You could go 0 to 5, 1 to 6, 10 to 15. They're, they're all 5 units wide. But the easiest one is just 0 to 3 pi over 2. So I'm going to put in 0. And remember, this is measuring how, like, it's measuring in radians the width of the cycle. So I need to make sure my calculator is in radians. If you wanted to do it in degrees, the answer would have been 90. That's the cycle length of 10. Okay, but we're, we're doing it in radians, so make sure your calculator is in radians. All right. Um, don't worry about the x scale, that doesn't matter. Um, it, and as far as how high and low the graph goes, well, it's going to go up and down forever. So negative 4 to 4 is probably OK. All right, so let's see if we see three cycles. Um, oh, did I not put in foam? I don't think I did. Uh, the original problem was tangent 2x. Type in tangent 2x. Hit graph. Well, that's half a cycle. Now that's one and a half. That's two and a half. And another half makes three. So we're showing three cycles. We're breaking up one of them into two halves. It's okay. It's not, you know. It'd be nice if they were three connected cycles, but that's not, it's not wrong. Okay, so here's your window. Any question on how we set a window that showed three cycles? Okay. All right, let's try this one. It says, using the graphs below, identify which one is 2 tangent x and which one is 5 tangent x. <coughs> what are the 2 and the 5 doing? What, um, what kind of transformation are they? Vertical stretches. They are vertical stretches. So one of these graphs is stretched vertically more than the other. Which one of those looks like it's been stretched vertically more? Yeah, the left one. Because the more you, the more you stretch it, this curve in the middle is going to try to start to straighten out. The more you compress it, then you'd exaggerate that curve. Okay, so this one on the left is five tangent x, and the one on the right is two tangent x. And we'll have something like that on the test. It'll be kind of like a drag and drop. You'll have like maybe four equations. You'll have four pictures, and you just have to match the graph picture to the to the formula for it. But it's I wouldn't give you one that's hard to tell. 
Like this one, I think is it's really clear. This one on the left is stretched more than the one on the right, so it'll be easy to tell. Okay. Any question on that? All right. So now let's um, think a little bit about um, the secant and the cosecant. Okay. How do you type secant in? I'm just gonna put that up above it on the calculator because we don't we don't have a button for secant. Yeah. And it's similar to how we would type in cotangent. We don't have a button for that either. But what did we do? Yeah? Wasn't it like something with like a negative one with the opposite of them or something like that? Uh, so we might have talked a little bit about the negative one that's the inverse trig. Yeah. Um, not what we're going for here, but we're going to talk a lot about that in Chapter 7 next week. Okay. And we might actually talk a little bit about it in 6.5 tomorrow. Okay. So important. hold on to that thought, but not for this. Okay. Um, anyone else remember or have an idea how you type C cannon? Yeah? Do you want over sine x? 1 over cosine x. Cosine x. And what about cosecant? 1 over sine x. So they both can be written as fractions. What do we always have to be careful about when you have a fraction? That you don't, you don't do what? Divide by zero. That you don't divide by zero. Well, for secant, cosine is in the bottom. We had a graph earlier that also had cosine in the bottom. Right here. And whenever cosine was in the bottom, and it came out to zero at those two values, what happens on a graph when you try to divide by zero? What do you get? Asymptote. Yeah, you get a vertical asymptote. We already know when cosine is in the bottom where the asymptotes are. Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So if we go back to secant, this is going to have exactly the same asymptotes as tangent. Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So it has vertical asymptotes, but it's not the same shape. It's more like a U shape and an N shape. That's a full cycle. So let me let me put a box around a full a full cycle. Actually, I'll do it like this. Let's number these asymptotes just like we did before. Down. And let me label the cycles like I did with letters. So we'll call this cycle A. Oops. That's cycle A. And we'll call that one cycle B. So a full U-shape and an N-shape, that's a full cycle. So look at cycle A. How many asymptotes do you think belong to cycle A? Two. Two, yep. So you could say, you could say that asymptote one belongs to A, and two belongs to A. And then three would belong to cycle B, and four would belong to cycle B. Again, it doesn't matter which ones you really think are in which cycle, it's just the idea that there's only two per cycle, not three. Because if one, two, and three all belong to A, well then you're going to run into a problem with B, because you can't say three, four, and five all belong to B, because three already belongs to A. Okay, so that's secant, and now cosecant is going to have asymptotes in common with um, cotangent, because cotangent has sine in the bottom. So if, if you look quickly, it looks kind of the same, but it's, it's not. The one on the left crosses the y-axis. The one on the right never does. They are a little bit different. 
And when sine is in the bottom, remember where your asymptotes are. 0, pi, 2 pi, 3 pi, and so on. And I just put a box around it to kind of explain that idea again, that there's two asymptotes per cycle or per period. All right, so the formula that we had for finding the period for tangent was pi over b. What's the formula we had for sine and cosine for finding the period? It wasn't, it wasn't pi over b. It's the original cycle length over b. So what's the original cycle length? 2 pi. 2 pi over b. And this is similar to sine and cosine in terms of the cycle length. It is 2 pi over b. So it's always 2 pi over b unless you're doing tangent or cotangent. Tangent and cotangent are kind of the, the different ones. Everything else is always 2 pi over b. Okay, so one thing we're, we're going to get to is when we do a transformation, right, we like shift it, stretch it, compress it. I'm going to want to know what happens to these asymptotes. And the way we're going to figure out what happens to them is we have to know where they are to start with. And then we can figure out where they move to. So I don't know if it's the next slide or... Yep, it's going to be the next slide. I'm going to give you a table that's going to tell you where the original asymptotes are for secant, cosecant, tangent, and cotangent. So it's just going to kind of organize because it can be kind of hard to remember. I'm only going to give you the asymptotes in one cycle. Because remember, how many, how many asymptotes are there really if you zoom out? Infinite. Yes, infinitely. We're just going to focus on the asymptotes in one cycle. Right, and let's start with tangent. I'm going to go back to my graph of tangent and just look at it for a second. Looking at that graph, where is the first positive asymptote? Pi over 2. Pi over 2. This is cotangent. Looking at that graph, I'm going to ask it a little differently. Where's your first asymptote that's not negative? Zero. Zero. Yep. So those are the ones we're going to use for those two. Pi over 2 and 0. These are the originals. And then this, this x1 thing, that's what I'm going to explain from page 6 that I skipped. But I wanted you to get this table first. And then I'll explain that part. Okay, the part that you should already hopefully kind of get <coughs> is that the asymptote repeats forever. You can't write them all down. So to represent all the asymptotes, you put plus the period times n. That represents that it keeps repeating every cycle forever. Okay, let's go back to our graph of secant. Uh, it was secant. Okay, so looking at the graph on the left, what were our first two positive asymptotes for secant? Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Yep, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And for cosecant, where are our first two asymptotes that are not negative? Zero and pi. Zero and pi. So let's write those down. 
pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, 0 and pi. And this plus period times n stuff just represents the asymptote repeating forever. But I have to explain how you get those things. So these x1 and x2s, these are where the original asymptotes are shifted to when you do a transformation. Where does this one go? That's that. Where does this one go? That's that. If you can figure out where these two go, all you have to do is tell me that and that they keep repeating forever. Okay. So how do you figure out where they go to? Okay, that, that's what I'm going to show you right now. Um, but first, I just want to make sure everybody has that table. Right, and you can use that if you want on the test um, on Friday. Okay, so let me go back to page, it's page six. So how do you figure out where those asymptotes are going to shift to? Okay. That's these steps right here. So it's basically how to find the x1 and the x2. Well, the first step is you need to know where they were originally. I've already told you that. So step one. All you have to do is look at the chart that you just wrote down in your notes. Find all the asymptotes in one cycle. That's done. Step two. This is what we have to do. We have to set the original asymptotes, which you're getting from your chart, equal to the argument and solve. Remember what your argument is. That's the argument. It's what's inside the parentheses. And then the last part of step two, I've already written in the chart for you. You take your answer, and you have to tell me that it repeats forever. So you put plus the period times n. And again, that's already on the right-hand side of your chart. So that's kind of a repeat. Okay, so step two is really the, that's the big thing you got to do. Set the asymptote equal to the argument and solve. Okay, so that, combined with the chart I just gave you, is going to help you to find asymptotes that we're going to do in the next one. Does everybody have that? And again, if you're not sure, we're going to practice step two. We're going to practice that right now. Okay. All right. So here's. Here's a problem. It says find the domain, the range, period, and the asymptotes. And there's not even a transformation. It's just basic seeking. No, no transformation. Right, let's start. Uh, let's start with period. What's the formula for the period of seeking? Pi over b, or two pi over b? Yep, 2 pi over b. What's b in this case? Or what's what's the number that's in front of the x? 
one, there's no transformation. So the period has no change. It's the original period, 2 pi. All right, let's do the, um, let's do the range. Let's look at the graph, and this is for secant. Actually, secant and cosecant have the same range. Let's look at the picture. Okay, we're looking at secant, this picture. Does the graph of secant go down forever? Yes. Yes, it does. Does it go up forever? Mm, yes. yes, it does. Does it hit every value in the middle going up and down? No. No. There's a, there's a gap here. They're all the same, but let's look at the top of this one. How high does it look like that, that one goes? It goes as high as negative 1. And how low does that one go? 1. So the range is everything except negative 1 and 1. Okay, so how do, we write, how do we write that? Well, let's go like this. So it's going to go, how low does it go? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. And that bottom section goes up to what number? And it hits it. So we include it. Or, and then after negative 1, it skips to what number? 1. Skips to 1. And how high does it go? Infinity. Infinity. Okay, so there's your range. All right, so we've got the period. Uh, we've got the range. Uh, let's do the vertical asymptotes. So step, let's go back to... Page six, find all asymptotes in one cycle of the original function. Okay, we are doing secant. The asymptotes in one cycle are pi over two and three pi over two. So I'm gonna put those off to the side <coughs> because I'm supposed to set each of those asymptotes equal to the argument and solve. Okay, let's do it. What's the argument in this problem? X. It's just x. It's not 2x, it's not 4x, it's just x. So is there anything you have to do to get x by itself? No, then those are your asymptotes. There was nothing we had to do with that stuff. So it's pi over 2. Oops, I should write it. I should write it the way I did over there. <coughs> so x equals uh, x equals pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, but that's not all the asymptotes, it's only two of them. How often is that top asymptote going to repeat? In general, it repeats every t times n. Yeah, every cycle, every period. What's the period of this one? And that's why I did the period first. 2 pi. 2 pi. So if you add 2 pi, you will get that asymptote in the next cycle. If you add 2 pi, you'll get it in the next cycle after that. How about this asymptote? How often does that one repeat? Two pi. Yep, that one also repeats every cycle times n. And that's how you write your vertical asymptotes. And then the domain, well, the way I usually do the domain is it's every number except the what? Except the asymptotes, yep. And that's, that's exactly what I write. It's all reals except any number of that format. Any number except the vertical asymptotes. So all reals except vertical asymptotes. So that's secant. Now, I'm not going to go through as much here for cosecant, but, well, 
Maybe we can go through it. What what would be the period of cosecant? Just regular cosecant. Two, 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 two pi. It's the same period as secant. Two pi. How about the range for cosecant? The same. It's exactly the same. The only difference between secant and cosecant is one is shifted a little bit left or right of the other. But it's exactly the same range. So negative infinity, negative one. Range. Um, vertical asymptotes, those are not the same. Only thing that's going to change are those two numbers. Where are the first two vertical asymptotes for cosecant? It's not pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. It's zero, 0 and pi. And that's the only thing that changes. And domain, all reals except the vertical asymptotes. So pretty, pretty simple. Question on one. All right, let's do one that, that has a transformation. It says find the period and the asymptotes of cosecant 3x. And then on the calculator, not, on, not by hand. And if it says to do anything by hand on the homework as far as sketching, you can use the calculator. It's always use the calculator. So find the period and the asymptotes. Okay. What is my formula to find the period when it's a cosine? What goes in the top? 2 pi. Yep. And in this case, it's going to be 2 pi over 3. That's my period. Okay, now it says uh, asymptotes. I'm not going to write them here right away because I can see the argument has a number there, so I'm going to have to deal with that. What did we say our asymptotes are for cosine? Just the first two. Zero and pi. Zero and pi. We're supposed to take each one of those asymptotes and set them equal to the argument. Yes. Now solve for x. And that's going to tell you what happens to each one of those. How do we get rid of the 3 in front of the x? Divide by 3. And what's 0 divided by 3? 0. So in other words, the asymptote that was at 0, it stays at 0. No matter how you compress or stretch zero, nothing ever changes. But the asymptote that was at pi is not going to stay at pi. When you put a 3 in front of the x, that's a horizontal compression by 3. So everything is going to get squeezed towards the origin. Unless you're already at the origin, then you just stay right where you are. The asymptote that was at pi is going to be squeezed three times as much towards the origin. It's now going to be at pi over three. Those are where the two original asymptotes move to. And technically one of them doesn't move. Okay. And now how often do each one of those repeat? Two pi over three. Yes. This one is going to repeat every cycle, and this one is going to repeat every cycle. That's why you always want to find the cycle length first, because you're going to need that to do the asymptotes. Okay, and show a graph of two periods, okay? So first we've got to put that in. Uh, we got to do it as 1 over sine. 
sine 3x. Okay, they want two cycles. If one cycle is 2 pi over 3, how much is double that? 4 pi over 3? Yep. So I would do a window from 0 to 4 pi over 3. And if we did this right, you should see exactly two U shapes and two N shapes. There's a U and an N, and it looks perfect. Another U and an N. That's exactly two cycles. And just write down the mins and axis. Any, um, any questions on that? Yeah. For the part right below the x axis, how do you get that? Uh, the x scale? Yes. Uh, the calculator sets that for you when you do zoom. I think I did zoom 7 at one point today. So we kept that. It's not really important. It's just how often you're going to see tick marks on the screen. But not really. I don't care what you put for that. Any question on that? All right, let's see where we are. Okay, um, so I think this is the last thing. Yeah. Right, let's um, think about if you had like a sine wave. And I wanted to know where that sine wave hits 0.3. Does what's the highest that a sine wave goes if you don't transform it? Goes to one. So will it hit 0.3? Yeah. It'll hit it'll hit 0.3 somewhere. In this case it hits it two times in that cycle. And if I keep drawing the wave, how many times are the line and the wave going to cross? Two times infinity. Well, two times for every cycle, and there's infinitely many cycles. So they're going to keep crossing infinitely many times. So the point is, if you can find them crossing one time in a cycle, then they're going to cross infinitely many times. You can't write down infinitely many answers. So if they give you a problem, and they say to find all solutions. Then what you have to do is find one solution in the first cycle, and then tell me that it repeats, plus the period times n. So you find all the solutions in one cycle, and then tell me how often they repeat. Technically, it doesn't matter which cycle you find the answers in. I usually do the first positive cycle. Those are the ones I do. And the reason it, it doesn't matter which cycle you find them in, because it's kind of like if I said, all right, I want you to set an alarm on your phone starting at 1 p.m. and it goes off every hour. Or I want you to set an alarm for 2 p.m that goes off every hour. Well, it's still the same thing. It's just you're starting at a different point, but it's still going to go off every hour, so there's no difference. Okay, it's the same thing here. It doesn't matter which cycle you find the answers in. It's going to end up being the same result. Just a different start point. Okay, so find all solutions to cosecant x equals negative 1.6. So you're going to type y1 and y2, and you're going to look for where they cross. How do I type in cosecant, since I don't have a button for it? Yep, it's going to be 1 over sine. So that goes in y1. Um, what goes in y2? Negative 1.6. And you want to set your window to one cycle. If you don't set it to one cycle, then what's going to happen is you're going to be looking at multiple cycles. You're going to find 
tons of intersections, and you're not going to know which two to do. Right? I can see just six right there. So we don't we don't want that. One cycle. What's the cycle for cosine? No no transformations. Two pi. So let's set a window from zero to two pi. That's going to focus in on just one cycle, and we'll find all the answers there, and then just say that they keep repeating. And that's what it should look like. You should be getting two answers per cycle. Okay, um, so what do I press to find um, where they cross? Yep, so we're going to go to second calc, intersect. Make sure you do move your cursor closer to the one that you want. So 3.82. And second calc intersect. Uh, 5.61. And if you write that, all you've done is tell me two answers. You haven't told me every answer. So what do you put on the end of each one of those? Plus period times area. Yep, and what's the period in this case? Yep. So if you want to know how much later does that answer occur again, it's 6.28 units later, 2 pi. That's the next answer. And same with the 5.61. That's how you do it. Question on um, oh, it? Last one. All right, so solve graphically. Tangent x equals 2.5. So we got two answers per cycle. Think about what tangent looks like, right? If you draw a horizontal line and you draw the tangent function, how many times is the horizontal line going to hit tangent per cycle? Just once. So there's only going to be one answer per cycle here. All right, um, what do we put in y1? Tangent x. Tangent x, we already have a button for it, so that's easy. Um, what about y2? 2.5. Now, if you don't set your window correctly, you're going to see tons of intersections. We only want to focus on one intersection in the first cycle. So to eliminate having to see all that, let's just set our window. What's the cycle for tangent? Pi. So set your window to exactly one cycle. Which cycle? Doesn't matter. Just one cycle. And if you do that correctly, now you're not going to have to worry about multiple intersections. You're only going to see one, and that's the one you want. Not that you couldn't do it from the other screen I was at, there's just more to look at. So second calc intersect. Um, this time, you do have to make sure that you get your cursor up on that blue section. If it's over or down, I don't think it'll work. So just keep pressing until it gets there. And we get 1.19. That's one answer. I want every answer. So how do we, what do we put on the end of that to represent all answers? Plus the period times n. And this time, the period is pi. So that's pretty much all that we do with graphing other trig functions. That's the whole thing. Um, tomorrow there's, there's no graphing at all. Okay, tomorrow is... I think it's, it's a little bit easier than this, and we're going to split it into two days and have a review day. So the rest of the week will feel a little bit slower paced. Okay. Questions on time?
Let me just double check, but I think that's... Okay, remember, any problems that say to sketch, you don't have to sketch by hand, you can do it on the calculator. Just write down your window.